Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar today. This is the fourth in a series in our series. My name is Yvonne Lewis. I am your co I'm the co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, which is a multi-institutional partnership led by a strong community core and our academic partners, Michigan State University, University of Michigan Flint, and the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We're so delighted that you've joined us and I wanna welcome you on behalf of the leadership team of the Fluff Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. Today is a very special day for all of us and I want to just really appreciate those of you who have joined us since March 20th. Since that point, many in our community have lost their lives as a result of the COVID-19. On this past Wednesday was Passover. And in the Jewish community, they recognize this tradition by celebrating. And one of the principles of their celebration is learn the lessons from the past and don't repeat them and share a message of hope. So today on the Christian calendar, calendar we recognize Good Friday, that day which Christ was crucified. I invite you to pause with me for a moment to acknowledge in, our own, in your own way the significance of this time. Remember and pray for those who have lost loved ones and celebrate those who, have, who are recovering from this invisible enemy. As we pause to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, we pray for mercy. Bring the comfort and peace to those who have loved ones that are lost and have been touched by this pandemic. We thank you for the protection, mercy, and grace that you provide. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one who loved us most. Amen. Thank you. We do recognize this is a very challenging time for our nation and for our community. So today we wanna to offer you some additional insights on relevant issues and provide more understanding and local context for what we are experiencing. Today you will see, we can go to the next slide, please. Today you will see that we have a wonderful panel, a series of panelists who will actually help us answer some of your questions. We're going to look at current trends and disparities. We'll have a clinical update. And so looking at our current trends and disparities will be Dr. Deborah for Holden, she's the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration, Director in, uh, and a CS Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health in the Division of Public Health, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. We'll also hear from Leslie Scalaris. Dr. Scalaris is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Associate Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan, Michigan, Medi Michigan Medicine. So Dr. Deborah, would you please give us some insights on that? And then following that, we're gonna to introduce to you our special guest speaker for today, Dr. Deborah. Wonderful, thank you, Yvonne. Um, and again, I just acknowledge and, and appreciate all these folks here on Good Friday and uh, for all of our other uh, brothers and sisters celebrating Passover and other religious celebrations. Uh, we've all heard a lot about um, what's been ha happening with the disparities. And I wanna call it out for what it is. COVID-19 is hitting Black Americans really hard. When you look, this is just an example. And the problem that we really have is that a lot of states haven't even provided us with data so that we can really understand the, the extent of the problem. So if you see here in Illinois, Louisiana, and Michigan, you can see the percent of the population that African Americans represent. This is what we represent by way of fatalities from COVID-19. And you can see it's on a two to three fold order difference in at least these three states, which were at least bold enough to publish that data. My point is we've been hit hard by this um, virus. The question is why? I think we've gone to the usual suspects in our explanations. We've talked about African-Americans having greater uh, existence of pre-existing health conditions like hypertension and diabetes. We've talked about their increased exposure because they're more likely to be in these frontline essential positions that oftentimes have high demand and low control, like lower level service workers in the healthcare industry or in the food and beverage industry or in custodial services. We've talked a lot about medical mistrust in that African-Americans 
uh, have historically had a negative experience in the healthcare system. And people are saying, so they're less likely to show up for care or not trust the care that they're getting. We've talked about misinformation or misunderstanding of information. We've also talked about and started to get into the world of social determinants of health. I think these explanations, we have all accepted them. If we are being honest, health disparities were the status quo pre-COVID, and unless something happens, they will remain the status quo throughout this epidemic and beyond the epidemic. But these explanations that we've provided so far are not actionable. Even if you think about the things we've talked about in relationship to the social determinants of health, the main thing that we've been talking about are things like poverty, things like unemployment, things that there is nothing that we can impact during this season. Most troubling is that these explanations have also influenced the algorithms for who gets what, who gets screened, who gets mobile testing? We have mobile testing in Michigan, but many of those mobile testing sites require that you have an order from a primary care physician. Well, we already know that African Americans are less likely to have a primary care physician, hence they'll show up for mobile testing and not have what they need to get that. For hospital admissions, for things like DNR, do not resuscitate orders. These algorithms have been, been created based on risk factors. So if you are an older African American with a pre-existing health condition, you are more likely to get a DNR. These algorithms, I believe, are highly attributable beyond the individual and patient level factors that we've been mostly pointing to, to the excess morbidity and mortality that we're seeing with COVID-19. And they are literally killing people, killing our people. So what are some of the solutions? One, we need to reorder the algorithm. Imagine if we started creating a hierarchy where instead of using those things as risk factors, we turned it around and we turned risk into priority for the continuum of care. Instead of using that against people, we use it in their favor. These then become the leverage points for prioritizing who gets what instead of limiting who gets what. The key takeaways I wanna give you with is we have to stop describing the problem and start implementing solutions and solutions that are things that are actionable. We need to map those solutions onto those priorities versus using them as variables for who gets what care. We need to focus on the factors that we can control and stop blaming the disparate for their health status and their access to care and their outcomes during the season. We need to bring that health equity lens. We know that these things exist. The question is now, what do we do about it? And what do we do about it given that we know it was the status quo pre-COVID. The last two points I want to make is that we have to use data to inform actions and interventions. And the way I think we can do that is by expanding public-private partnerships. Academics, public health people are at the ready to help our frontline people and to help our healthcare system use the data that we have to understand what's happening and the things that are actionable and the things that we can control. With that said, I'd like to hand it over to my great colleague, uh, Dr. Leslie Scaleras, who's gonna remind us of the importance of chronic disease management during this season. Thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted to participate. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Furholden. And um, I just wanna add to that. Uh, next slide. So, um, we have experience throughout the world and throughout Michigan, a decrease in people coming to the hospital for strokes and heart attacks. And my plea to you today is that emergent, health emergencies are health emergencies, and we are missing opportunities to help people who are not coming to the hospital. And so I know we've heard a lot of the last couple of weeks about about the what the coronavirus the coronavirus itself so today i thought i wanted to just have a couple of minutes just to talk about the un, some of the unintended consequences of the coronavirus and my take-home point today is if you experience a stroke or a heart attack those are those are emergencies you should seek emergent medical care to give yourself the best chance to get better from them so I just want to review the symptoms of a stroke. They're remembered by this acronym FAST, which is FACE for droopy face, 
arm for arm weakness, S for slurred speech or mixed up speech, and T is time equals brain. Every minute counts when someone's having a stroke, call 911 and get to the hospital. You should go to the hospital if you experience even just one symptom. Even though the emergency room is busier than usual, even though there are other sick people in the emergency room, stroke is always an emergency and heart attack is always an emergency. These life-saving drugs are only available in the hospital and they're only available and they work so much better the faster that we give them. So please, I, my take home message today is if, if you or someone you know is experiencing symptoms of a stroke and heart attack, the fast chance they have to get better is to go to the hospital quickly and please do so. So for any more information, you here are his information on our website, strokeready.com, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Scaleras. We also want to remind our participants today that you have the opportunity to chime in your questions. Go down to the bottom of your screen, look, click that Q&A button and ask those questions. And I do see questions are starting to come in. For your awareness, on our panelists today, we have Anita Stewart from the Flint Schools, Billy Mitchell from the City of Flint Technical Advisory Committee, Brenda Jagadick from MS the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She's in the Office of Health Equity and Minority Health. Brian Larkin from the City of Flint. Clarence Pierce, Hamilton Community Health Network. Dr. Fro Holden will continue to be there. Harmony Lloyd is also available for the Mass Transit Authority. Isaiah Oliver, Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Uh, Jennifer Johnson will also have information from the Genesee Health Plan. Dr. Lawrence Reynolds from the City of Flint. Leslie Scalaris will continue to be on the line to answer your questions. We also have again returning Dr. Michael Tupper from Hurley Medical Center, Renee Kennedy from the Michigan Public Health Institute, and Susan Kupel from the Genesee County Health Department along with Tricia Hill. They are here to respond to your questions, so please put those questions in so we can respond to them as we're moving through the webinar. And then we'll also have Q&A following this next great speaker that we have. We want to welcome to Flint via the HFRCC webinar on this very important issue, Dr. Reverend Todd Yeary. He is a senior pastor of Douglas Memorial Community Church in Baltimore. And he is also the senior vice president of the Rainbow Push Coalition. He's going to give us some real important insights about the role of the faith of faith community, our churches, faith-based organizations as it relates to this virus and a call to action. Dr. Yeary. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Yvonne and uh, Dr. Deborah Farr Holden and to your colleagues for this opportunity uh, to share with you on today. Uh, first, let me start by wishing all of you a uh, blessed holy season, whatever uh, your religious uh, observance might be. Uh, we recognize that there's an interesting convergence this year, Passover, of course, uh, and Good Friday being within hours, literally, of one another, and then also Ramadan, which will begin uh, in a few days from now. And so this is a really important time to have this discussion, and I think it is uh, beneficial that we would capture it, Yvonne, as you set it up, uh, in the context of what these observances mean. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Passover uh, is a time for uh, reflection and recommitment. And uh, as you were talking about what that meant, the Seder meal and the telling of the story, uh, in, in the Black tradition, uh, we often look to uh, the Akan in Ghana, West Africa, and the notion of Sankofa, you can't move forward without looking back. And so if we don't take what we're going through now and put it in some sort of historical context and continuity, we're gonna actually uh, uh, do a disservice uh, to communities that are often at the highest risk and most vulnerable uh, to systemic abuses uh, that actually affect our ability to cope. So with that, let me just kind of uh, talk to you about this notion of the role of religion and spirituality uh, when dealing with uh, African-American communities in crisis. If we think about uh, what grounds uh, religion and spirituality, it really is worldview. And when I teach uh, the notions of uh, spirituality and worldview, 
there are four components that we usually uh, look to to understand worldview, right? Axiology, epistemology, cosmology, and ontology. They, they actually ask four essential questions that have to be really understood in context if we're going to meet the needs uh, of the persons we're trying to serve. So the first, axiology, what are the core values? Uh, we assume uh, that somehow or other there is synergy because someone comes into us that we know what their core values are and then we begin to prioritize by assumption uh, certain references and recommendations that they might apply. I would say that we have to be a little more uh, diligent in appreciation, in, in appreciating rather diversity, particularly around core values. Epistemology, how do we know what we know? For many folks uh, who engage the healthcare system from African American communities, they know what they know from experience. And it is the experience of uh, longstanding uh, historical racism going back to the genesis of this country, as we are still kind of in this 400th year of remembering the first recorded arrival of uh, Africans on these shores in what were the original 13 colonies at Point Comfort, which is actually near Hampton, Virginia. So when we think about how do we know what we, we know from experience in history, it's not always what's been recorded, but what's been transmitted and passed down, the telling of stories that often override what gets published because it is inconsistent uh, with the telling and the sharing of knowledge that we've come to know. Cosmology, what is the order of the universe? The grounding for, uh, I would argue, most black folk, and this is in the research, we tend to be uh, much more religious, much more uh, spiritual in terms of our expression. The order of the universe has a divine source and a divine intent, it then informs uh, everything else that flows within the healthcare context. And then ontology, what does it mean to be? The question is not just to be or not to be. That is not the question when we talk about uh, African-American communities. What we're really talking about is what does it mean to be Black in America? And then wrestling with how that then gets translated uh, into uh, our systems of process. Next slide, please. Core functions of spirituality and religion, uh, coping, consultation, crisis management, and, and confidence building. I want to go through these uh, kind of in order. I think I left the slide out, so I'll make sure I touch all the points, uh, even as they appear to be uh, collapsed. So let's, let's talk about coping. Coping, uh, how do I navigate situations that I am not familiar with, and how then uh, do I make informed decisions consistent with how I see myself, how I see the possibilities for my situation, and then also uh, in a way that connects me with the intent that I believe the divine has for me. So the coping function is often about engagement, meeting people where they are. Very often, as we've seen throughout this crisis and many others, is that the, the statistics that are often used are actually uh, statistics imposed on communities of color because we typically draw our data from folks that are not prioritized uh, to be part of the inputs early on. So we gotta meet people where they are. That's the coping function of religion, uh, the interpretive function. Uh, this is where I would invoke uh, that great uh, uh, cultural theologian, the late Marvin Gaye. And this is where, you know, as preachers, uh, we read the Bible, uh, but we also read the cultural context and some of our best preaching comes uh, from the nuances of just being black in America. Marvin had the profound question, what's going on, right? Uh, there's far too many of us dying, right? Too many, too much crying. What's going on? That's the question. And to interpret what is going on, what's happening to me is a key function of religion. That's why uh, in all of these shutdowns of mass gatherings um, and the ability to come together in a time of fellowship, it has actually imposed a great urgency in faith communities all across the country to stay connected uh, with our congregations because we have to continue to interpret for them what's going on. And that also includes uh, the notion of translation and being a source of accurate information. They don't always trust what they hear, especially when there's been kind of this antagonistic uh, engagement with the current administration and now we're in the midst of a crisis and we have to, we're expected to take at face value what they tell us is the situation 
uh, of what's going on. And so we've seen this slide across the country. Uh, governors in states saying, oh, it's not that bad. I'm not going to put these uh, best practice uh, recommendations into play. Oh, no, go ahead and do what you've been doing. It's not a problem. And the next thing you know, we begin to see uh, the brewing of a, a huge issue in communities that have been disserved uh, by uh, poor information. And then we have to translate what's, what's commonly not understood. So let's talk about crisis management, right? Here's how religion intera interfaces and interacts in real time. Let me kind of walk you through a scenario. If a member comes and says, look, uh, they call, uh, I've been told I've got uh, COVID-19. I've actually had this conversation with members. Husband and wife, both of them contracted. Husband is now on a vent. The wife is at home. They can't be present. Now you have to have this communication from folks that you don't know about how to make real-time decisions without being able to confirm what it is that you're hearing. And so very often in this process, what we will see is that there will be outreach to uh, faith leaders, pastors and the like, uh, to help with uh, processing and decision making, and also to make sure that there are folks who are uh, present in this process with such high numbers of death. There are still funerals going on. We still have to honor the value of life and even the afterlife in this process. And so crisis management is at the core of uh, this kind of religious engagement. And I think it has to be used, I think, more effectively. The, uh, the confidence building piece, right? How do we make sure that there's resilience uh, in this process? Um, religion is more than a prophylactic, to put it in kind of the, 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 the healthy uh, kind of terminology. Uh, it is not just about uh, uh, defense, right? It's got to be about recovery and resilience and rising above because that's really what is at the core of particularly black religion, regardless of your religious tradition. It is a story of, re of resilience and it comes with advocacy. Who's going to be the voice for those who have no voice? Who's going to speak up at the table for folks who don't get a seat at the table to talk about what's going on. And that's why this conversation is particularly uh, important because uh, we're dealing with two types of advocacy in real time. There's situational advocacy, making sure that folks on the ground are getting what they need in real time, right? That's, that's got to be the advocacy. So we're calling public health officials, calling uh, elected officials, calling other advocates, having conference calls, finding out what's going on on the ground. And then there's systemic advocacy. When we get to the other side of this, we're going to have to do some review and some critique and talk about how do we make sure that we don't go through this ever again. And so I want to just kind of leave here that the advocacy is so critical here because in that historical memory that I first talked about, eugenics is a real deal. There is a fear because of systemic racism and how it's been carried out uh, both inside healthcare and beyond healthcare over our history, that this could very well be another opportunity to impose the extinction of an entire race of people under the guise of there being a crisis. And so faith leaders have to call folks to task and, and, and call a spade a spade to make sure that if we're going to be serious about addressing this situation, for communities that have been put upon for hundreds of years in this country that the advocacy function is particularly critical. So I'm open to your questions. That's a quick flyover, uh, but I think you can uh, actually uh, benefit by more engagement with faith leaders as we continue to deal with the current uh, public health crisis in our country. Dr. Pastor Yeri, thank you so much. You know, we often talk about putting things into context and so we thank you for bringing that historical perspective into the conversation and also bringing it to us today. So as a matter of us looking more closely at what faith communities, faith leaders, faith-based organizations can do today, uh, w many have been thrust into this public health world without having that as their background. And so if you can connect for us, what can we do today? And even include some of the, the important information about the stimulus package that mm -hmm. has now become available and how faith communities might be able to, to utilize that as a resource for improving the, 
the ministry part of the outreach in our communities? Yeah, so let me talk about that second question first uh, about the stimulus package. Uh, under the CARES Act, which was uh, just signed into law uh, a, a few days ago and the rollout of, uh, of implementation started a week ago today, uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not faith-based institutions were covered under the provisions of the act, which allows for uh, the provision of salaries for eight weeks uh, to staff whose only uh, disruption to their employment has been the byproduct of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And so faith institutions are able uh, to apply for uh, a loan. It starts as a loan from a small business lender. There's a, we call them 7A lenders in their area uh, to be able to process 2.5 times, two and a half times uh, their average monthly payroll uh, to cover the cost of keeping uh, their employees uh, paid to be able to take care of uh, essential payments, lease payments, mortgage interest payments, and the like. In that period of time, if those dollars are used for those designated purposes, at the end of this process, what starts as a loan turns into a grant. The debt is forgiven, and then it allows them for the ongoing work of faith institutions, albeit in a different format, uh, to continue in real time for communities that rely upon them. So the CARES Act is, is really important. SBA.gov is where I would point folks to be able to get more information and to see how to uh, navigate that process. And I'll make myself available uh, for that as well. Uh, but then the other thing about the, the need to know in this process is that we've heard a whole bunch of stuff, right? We've overwhelmed communities uh, with a whole lot of, of chatter not all of it is what I would call information. Remember, one of the functions uh, that I talked about in coping is interpretation. And so a lot of times there's a disconnect because of what we're talking about uh, is, is in a language that we don't understand. So when we say an algorithm, right? An algorithm to someone in a community that doesn't understand what an algorithm is, doesn't understand what, what an algorithm is designed to point to, how we would use it to interpret you got to figure out how to distill that information because here's the reality. In the United States, the average reading level across the country is eighth grade. We cannot talk above the level of the folks who need to use the information. And in some communities who have been left behind because of the issues of poverty and race, that achievement get, gets even worse because many times we are now writing our information on a fourth grade level while trying not to offend those who are much more educated. So I think you gotta get, uh, get the language in a form that folks can understand. And then you gotta deal with two things. You gotta deal with misinformation, inadequate information, uh, and we just gotta do what we tell them in church. You gotta tell the truth. What's the truth of the matter? Don't give me the gloss. Uh, don't give me the talking point. Tell me what's going on, because if I keep hearing the same game, I'm gonna tune you out. And I think you're beginning to see in some uh, sectors of our community, folks beginning to tune out because they're hearing and seeing conflicting things about what's really going on. Right. Just one more question with respect to your um, presentation today, uh, Pastor Year. We know that you're, you're very, very involved uh, at, a, at a national level with Rainbow Push and some of the other things. Uh, for pastors and faith leaders, because we do have a number of them on the call, and we've had a number of questions about this. In this climate, are there some specific instructions or uh, guidance you can give as for faith leaders as to how they can advocate for their congregations, especially when we can't congregate? Yeah, so <laughs> thank you for that. You got to use all of the tools available to keep folks connected. Uh, we know that there are great disparities in terms of technology access. And so, um, you know, we use social media, we use the internet, I use the phone. I had a conference call uh, with my congregation a couple of times on yesterday just to kind of check in so they could talk to each other and we could laugh a little bit. And I could give them some information because for my older members, the way they did uh, social interaction was they got on the phone. Uh, they are of the generation where uh, a party line was their day-to-day -day reality. They, that's how they communicate. And then we also follow up, the mail is still running. 
Uh, I know it is, is an additional cost, but I send them information to make sure I'm touching as many people as many times as possible to make sure by repetition uh, they get the information. Now to what ministers can do. We have an obligation to tell the truth too. And there's some myth busting that we have to do about the role of religion uh, and how it is played out in the midst of this uh, coronavirus situation. I, uh, as, as many of my faith colleagues who, who uh, perform certain functions, one of our responsibilities is to help folks grieve. We do funerals. I've seen uh, intentional death. I've seen accidental death. Uh, but what I've come to know about both of them is they're the same. Dead is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I pretend that somehow or other we're going to test our faith by testing death, right? Death is going to eventually come. That's what the resurrection is all about. That's what Good Friday, we overcome death. Overcoming and running to it are two different things. And so we got to make sure that we tell the truth. Social distancing is real. Staying at home is serious. Don't be hanging out on the corner. Don't be having your card party and your house party and hanging out together because we have actual evidence from black folk who have gathered in those settings and within days, you began to see the spread of active COVID-19 in these communities and many of those persons uh, did not survive. And so we, we have this backlog of funerals because at some point, you know, we've taken, we walk by faith and not by sight uh, and we've distorted it in terms of its meaning, right? My people perish for lack of knowledge. Don't be ill-informed. It's one of the core values that goes in well view, in our worldview. And the other thing is don't test God. The information, God gave us medicine for a reason. They're telling us that there are some universal things that we can apply while we're checking the rest of the system. Don't push it. Find a way to help folks to worship because we've not always had buildings, but we've always had church. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Dr. Yuri, again, thank you so much. I, I, this one last question that is coming in, and we have heard your, your, your pleas for us to put our faith into action by following these guidelines. But with your role at Rainbow Push, and the question is, how do we get a seat at the table? You know, we, we, once sometimes, once people get to the table, there's always questions about whether or not they're still representing the community. So how do we get a seat at the table and how do we trust the individuals who are sitting there on our behalf? Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, 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 to restate the points because I wanna hit both of them, right? How do we get a seat at the table? How do we get a seat at the table? How do we get a seat at the table? To understand how we have gotten a seat at the table over a period of time uh, is by persistence and insistence, right? Uh, we keep showing up at the door. Sometimes we have to kick in the door. Sometimes we have to hold our own meeting, right? Just because they won't let us in their meeting does not mean we cannot have our own meeting and begin to raise those issues. And so I think it's got to be uh, multifaceted in terms of how to get a seat at the table, but this is a relationship game. That's the truth of the matter. We have to know somebody. It ain't what you know, it's who you know. You got to know somebody who knows somebody. Everybody's got to put their Rolodex and their skill on the table uh, to begin to get into some of these conversations that are prioritized uh, when we start thinking about the implementation of public health. Here's what we know. Uh, as this data comes out, we're already hearing it the disparities, particularly in the black community, that scares folks. It's an election year, that's real talk. Everybody's gonna be appealing to some sense of urgency in a time of fear. Now's the time to make your presence known and your demands clear uh, by persistence, insistence, and if necessary, leverage a relationship that gets your seat at the table or pass a note, right? That's how we used to get information from the black back of the classroom to the front. We would get the person in front of us and say, Psst, Pass this note down. We got to share the information and not get caught up in the trap of uh, ladder climbing and success building that causes us to kind of hoard what we've got be because we would rather be recognized than relevant. Okay, so the second part of that is, so how do we encourage people, <laughs> this is a crucial issue, uh, that they are continuing to represent once they get to the table? We're continuing to truly represent the African American, and I will say, let's let's broaden that: people of color, people who are underserved, 
because we know we're focusing in on this disparity issue, but we, we really want to make sure that the voices of community are being heard at these tables. Yeah, I think we have to remember that when we find a seat at the table, that we don't misread our access as an entitlement because of qualification, right? So whenever I find myself at a seat at the table, I ain't the first black person, I ain't the first Negro to end up at the table. There are people who are smarter than me, brighter than me, never had the opportunities that I had, never could get in. So my obligation when I get into the table is to demystify that first issue, right? I'm qualified to be here, but this isn't a qualification issue. This is a boldness issue. I may not get back to this table, but while I'm here, I'm going to lay it out here. I'm not here for you to like me. I'm here for you to hear me. And so we got to make sure that we stop turning these in to check the box um, uh, opportunities to try to say, here's why I'm better than the next Negro who's trying to ladder climb in this process. You know, you're not going to make, if you're going to really be about this thing called justice, you're not going to make a whole lot of friends. And so if you need uh, a whole lot of presence and a whole lot of stroking of your ego to be able to do it, I would just quite honestly say, I don't want you at the table because you become a liability and a risk. And at some point you may compromise what needs to be said for the sake of making sure that they invite you back to the next meeting. Thank you. One, one thing I think too, as we think about this issue, there are a lot of opportunities for people to have voice. And so sometimes we, are not the necessarily the spokesperson, but we have an opportunity to interject the perspectives of others. Yep. And so yep. I just want to encourage all of our, our listeners and our participants on the webinar today, continue to send those questions in. We're gonna have we're gonna open this up more broadly in just a moment here. But we want to be sure that all of us recognize that at some point you may be the voice that's sitting at that table. Don't forget your brother and sister. If they I, may let me even look like you. But there, there are needs out there. If you're at a table, you have the opportunity to speak that voice. Dr. Year. Yeah, real quick. There are some things that we can do, right? Um, there are different tables, right? There's the policy table. Uh, there's the perspective table. So what you can do is collaborate on writing an op-ed piece, right? Uh, many of these policymakers read what's going on uh, in the space as, as a way of taking the temperature. Uh, you may not be able to get at the decision-making table, but you may be able to get to somebody who is at the table, your elected officials. See, these are the reasons why we keep talking about voting matters, right? Those are points of access to make sure that we have redundancy and different opportunities of accountability to make sure our issues are raised and our voices are heard uh, in these different processes. This is Monopoly. Monopoly board has changed several times. They never changed the rules. So if you're waiting on the rules of the game to be changed to satisfy you before you decide you're going to play it to win it, you're going to find yourself watching everybody else move on without you. Dr. Year, we thank you so much. You're going to stay on the line with us. He'll be here if you have some more specific questions. Please go to the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button there. We're asking you to put your questions into the queue and we'll get to them. There are some really important questions that are on the queue, in the queue right now. We have some additional presenters that we're gonna hear from, and I think they're gonna answer some of these questions and we'll get them in. So we wanna go now quickly to uh, the health department, some of our community leaders. Suzanne Kupel from the health department has some really important updates from the health department. We're also gonna hear from uh, the city of Flint and from the state of Michigan. One of those questions that you have, I, I, I hear you and I see you. We're gonna get to that question about what Michigan is doing. So please, Suzanne, give us an update on what's happening in our community from the perspective of the health department. She may be trying to unmute herself. Okay. Uh, they'll give me a sign. Let's, let's move on quickly to the city of Flint, Brian Larkin. All righty then, we're gonna keep it rolling. We'll come back to, to the city of Flint. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Brenda, I know you're there. Please unmute your mic. Uh, we, have, we have a question for you, uh, one that was posed, but I, I hope that you might be able to answer this for me because we know that not every state has the same reporting standards. 
And I, Michigan has been a leader, as has already been indicated. Michigan has been a leader in putting these uh, data, of making these data available about many of these things. How, how is the state of Michigan actually going to utilize this data to hopefully make some improvements in the outcomes that we see? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, as we've heard um, from many on the call and um, even, you know, um, those who have been advocating um, prior to the call, it's extremely important for us to have data, and specifically data by race and ethnicity. And it's one of our main strategies um, at the department and in the Office of Equity and Minority Health for advancing equity. We um, always promote the collection, the use, the dissemination of data that's disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Um, so as we um, have seen, um, we recently started to report uh, data by race and ethnicity, and we were promoting um, reporting of that information. There was, There is a lot that happens behind the scenes at the local level and with all of the different um, public and private entities that are reporting data. So although we are reporting data, we still see that there is a lot of unknown um, data by race and ethnicity. Um, as high as you know, 24 to 34 percent data is missing by race in terms of those who are infected and those who have died from the virus and then even higher um, rates of missing data for um, both um, from 39% to 49%. So that's something that we're continuing to work on because we need that information. But we did decide uh, last week as one of the first states to report that data. We um, are looking at that data to make some decisions um, regarding our testing needs. We heard from our medical executives and others that we still don't have, um, for instance, the amount of tests that we need in the state and still advocating for those resources. And we're also wanting to hear from the local um, areas in terms of some of our regional epidemiologists and even the health departments, how they're using some of the data to make decisions and to allocate resources. Um, one of the things recently our area is looking to do is to replicate some method methodology that was shared by um, Ohio, their director um, in the Office of Health Equity, um, Chip Allen. He's a leader in the area around data. And we're looking to work with our Bureau of Epidemiology and Population Health to look at some data by census tract. We're trying to right now do some mapping. We know that CDC has already provided some analysis, they call it their social vulnerability index, where there are, they have already looked at things like socioeconomic status, household composition, minority status and language, housing and transportation, and they've already made a statement that there are communities uh, across the nation that are already ill prepared to handle a disaster. So they've called that their social vulnerability index. And they have some data that they pulled on 500 throughout the country where we can look at the areas that have the highest morbidity data. So we're looking to map that data as quickly as we can within Michigan so that at the health department, we can start to see if there are needed resources in these particular areas that we believe would be um, impacted, uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, and then also share that data to local areas so that we can begin to make some decisions based on that data. So, so Brenda, I think you, you, you've helped us because we just want to be clear that that data isn't just sitting somewhere, but you are making active steps to get that data out to the local health departments as well as to the health care providers. Correct. Wonderful. All right. So I want to just thank you. Thank you so much for that, Brenda, because this is, this is such a challenge when we see this. 
we hear a lot of conversations, but we're not sure what actions are being taken. And because it's so difficult for all of us to be at the, in the background of this, it's nice that you're able, and all of our presenters are able to bring this information forward so we in community can actually see and understand what's going on. I want to double back to um, the health department, I mean, excuse me, to the health department, yes. Uh, Suzanne Kupel, can you, based upon the fact that the state is doing their part, what is happening here that you can share with us from the public health department here in Genesee County? So Ivan, I got bumped off and I just got put back on, so I missed a part of the conversation. But uh, we do post data every day to our website at 2 p.m., so we're in the midst of Okay, sounds like we might have lost her again. Okay, my tech team is gonna work on that. Let's 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 keep moving because this time is so important. Let's go to to the to Dr. Tupper. Uh, Dr. Tupper, we had a question that I want to pose to you, and then if you can give us some insights on what's happening at the hospital. But one of the questions is, what are some of the signs? We, we're being told so many things, and I think Dr. Deborah and both Dr. Yuri mentioned the misinformation. One of the questions was, are there new signs like a oh, oh, she came back. Hi, it's Suzanne. I keep getting muted. Um, this, so I was saying that I missed part of the conversation, but I did want everyone to know that we post data to our website every day at 2 p.m. And that data includes not only the information about the number of positive test results and the number of deaths in the community, but it is broken down by um, ethnicity, by race, by age, um, by geographic location, and it also tells information about hospitalization rates. All right, thank you, Susan. Suzanne, and you, and you point out something very important. This data is available to us. And again, this is the reason why some of our partnerships are so important, like the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. And some of you that are on the, on the webinar, you have programs and services that you're providing. You can look at this data and we can really, even in our community, begin to identify how we can best address this issue. Let me go back again. Thank you. Dr. Tupper, I was just about to, to ask you a question that came from one of our participants about some of the new kinds of signs that people are talking about that are um, expressions of what the vi whether they may have the virus or not. And one of them is, is it true that uh, rashes on the hand or the leg might be a sign that they may have COVID-19? So it is true that um, rashes can be associated with a lot of viral illnesses. Uh, and so there is a case series uh, from Italy that does show that they did describe rashes in some patients patients. Uh, now I would say based on our experience it's a uncommon finding um, and it would be unlikely to present in isolation just as a rash as the, as, as the only thing that's suggestive of COVID. But uh, yes rash has been described. Uh, typically it would be more of a generalized rash as opposed to a rash that's just localized to one area. Um, but we see rashes with a lot of viral illnesses, so that would not necessarily be unexpected. Um, what's also being reported um, in the last week or so in one of the journals is that they're finding that a lot of, a lot of patients, about a third will report loss of taste or a loss of smell um, as one of the symptoms that may be suggestive of COVID-19. Uh, these are also nonspecific symptoms, meaning a lot of different things can cause that. Um, but if you do notice something like that, um, maybe something to pay attention to and speak with your doctor. Um, and then certainly be on the lookout for other of the more typical symptoms. And the more typical symptoms continue to be fever, fatigue, body aches, and cough. So, so Dr. Dr. Tupper, I know every hospital has their protocols and you were so kind in, in clarifying last week for us what happens and how they prioritize uh, one of the concerns that has been brought forward is people are presenting at the hospitals, but they don't know how to advocate for themselves. They don't know how to say, uh, yeah, I got a fever, but I need you to know before you tell me to go home that I have an underlying health condition. Mm -hmm. so, so how are you addressing that? Even though you have these priorities, how do we help community members understand when they present, 
how they can help you understand what their condition is and why it might be important for them to be seen and in hospitalized. Yeah, so when we're making those decisions on testing and, and, and uh, hospitalization, it's very important to know what those underlying medical conditions are. And so um, being, uh, being accurate and forthcoming with the, with the, uh, with the medical history and um, if, you, if you have a list of your medications or a list of your uh, medical problems, that can always, that can always uh, be helpful um, in determining uh, the, the uh, criteria for hospitalization and testing. Right. So one last question for you before we move on quickly. Do you have any idea, Dr. Tupper, about the, the availability of testing broad, more broadly for our community members? Because if we, we can't get tested, we may not be able to really get a handle on this. Yeah, so uh, we're in the same position. Um, uh, our testing capacity continues to increase. Uh, we continue to get more testing kits allocated to our institution. So we're able to now test uh, on a limited basis at the medical center. Um, in addition to sending out uh, what we have to to other laboratories. Uh, so we're starting to have increased testing capacity. Um, when can we, I agree the goal is to implement widespread testing in the community. Um, and that is just a matter of having the, uh, the, the uh, testing resources available. And I think it'll be soon, um, probably not in the next week or so, but potentially thereafter that we'll be able to consider uh, more widespread testing. What also is developing and should be available within the next week or two is in addition to the swabs to test you for the virus, um, we will start to see uh, blood tests, antibody tests available, which would basically indicate that you have been exposed to the virus and have developed antibodies. So potentially the theory is these may be able to demonstrate immunity and decrease risk of acquiring the virus. Um, and that's gonna be very important um, as we decide how to reopen the country and reopen the economy is having antibody testing available to know who's actually had this virus because we've been so limited with who, can we, who we can test and who may potentially have some level of protection from getting sick again is going to be tremendously important. Thank you, Dr. Tupper. We appreciate you being on to be a resource for us. I want to go quickly back to the city of Flint. Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, who is the Public, the health advisor for the city of Flint is uh, on the line. Dr. Reynolds, just give us an update and give us some insights on, on, on your uh, work in the, in the city and what we can understand. I will, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. All right, I'll start with uh, letting you know, we apologize, we're on two different calls at one time. <laughs> uh, the question of drive up testing has come up uh, and since I'm on this call, I don't know the status of their plans, but we're rocking in the same boat as uh, Dr. Tupper. If you can get the right test, if you can get the right equipment, and that goes down to something as simple as the right swab for the test, if you can get proper uh, personal protective equipment, uh, if you can make sure the lab has the reagents or the chemicals that help the test uh, be performed, if you can satisfy all those things, record the results, get the results back to the person in a timely fashion, and report it to the state of Michigan. Uh, if you can do all these things, you have an effective testing system. Unfortunately, all those conditions do not exist right now. So that's why Mr. Larkin is on the other phone call. Uh, also, uh, we're working on uh, housing for the homeless. Now, if you provide those services, it also require, requires a significant coordination of services among partners. Uh, even something as simple as uh, food, crisis intervention, uh, substance abuse, uh, folks who uh, need uh, to check in uh, with, with some other resource on a regular basis, and who comes in and who comes out, uh, as well as sanitation. 
Uh, so that is also in progress. Uh, and hopefully we'll have something to report next week. Uh, the most important thing is, yes, we have a curfew here from 9 to 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. And some people will say, why do you have to do that for the city of Flint? Well, we are trying to be proactive. We have looked at the shortage of masks. We have looked at uh, the effect of uh, pulling uh, police officers or others off the street to handle social gatherings uh, that are not recommended at this time. And in the entire county, people forget that our sheriffs are also emergency medical technicians. So if there's a gathering going on that's inappropriate inside or outside, you're tying up emergency medical services. And we'd like to to reduce the, the traffic on the streets because that will reduce transmission. Uh, if you've noticed, stores have shortened their hours. Stores have reduced the capacity of, of who can, the governor by executive order has reduced the number of people who can be in a store at one time. So the whole goal is to uh, reduce unnecessary trips and reduce uh, social contact to have that well to ha implement social distancing so that there's yes. no unnecessary risky contact from crowds and uh, there was a discussion earlier about gatherings for religious ceremonies well uh, my stepmother is from Albany Georgia and people gathered for a funeral and after that funeral uh, there was an explosion in cases in a small town with a population of 73,000 people in Southern Georgia. So these are the things that we're trying to avoid because when we talk about racial disparities in care, when we talk about unequal access, if we don't govern our own behavior, Help is not on the way in a timely fashion. Thank, thank you, Dr. Reynolds. I know there's so much. I've, I've got only a couple of minutes, a few minutes left. We appreciate that update from the, um, from the city. Just one quick question Isaiah Oliver can answer for us, and we're going to just kind of scroll through so that you can see some of the resources that we have available for you. Still can, um, the health plan is available to help you. We have Greater Flint Health Coalition that can assist you with uh, resources and, and enrollment and to cover it into the registry. Uh, just all of these, these resources are available. Uh, one quick question uh, to Isaiah Oliver. We know that the governor has put, forth, put a task force in place to address these issues. If you can just like in 30 seconds, give us a little glimpse of what's happening with that, and then we will have to wrap up. I'm so sorry we can't get to all of your questions today, but stay tuned. We've got some more things coming for you. Isaiah. Hey, actually, I'll be able to leave some time on the clock here because I am not outside of maybe, um, making some recommendations for folks to join that task force, 100% sure um, how the governor plans to move forward. I do know that the lieutenant governor will be leading or chairing that task force, and they're looking to have a system of experts from across the state of Michigan helping to guide the work that the governor will be doing, uh, essentially putting her foot down that this is important doubling down on the types of research that they've been taking in and sharing alongside Louisiana and a few other states, but not many as many of the presenters earlier have shared. So we're really as a state doubling down on the fact that this is an epidemic that is impacting um, traditionally marginalized groups, more specifically African Americans, more than others, and that we have as a state have to do something about it. But that is about the extent of the information I have right now. Thank you, Isaiah. We just want those of you that are on this webinar to please be aware that we're doing our best to bring information for you. We may not have all the answers, but here's one way you can help us. Um, at the end of this webinar, Dr. Deborah is going to give us some insights on how you can help us be better able to help you. We need to hear from people. Can you hear me, uh, yes. Yvonne? Yes. So I'm going to selfishly take about uh, 30 seconds and just acknowledge you, Yvonne uh, Lewis, as a tremendous leader in the Flint community, who as a partner that I've worked with has been nothing more than an unrelenting stand in the stake in the ground that Flint rise out of this season better and stronger. Most of the panelists and all of the great work that's been happening out of this series of webinars 
Yes, it is a collaborative with the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center with MSU, U of M Flint, University of Michigan, and a very strong community core. And you have made the difference for us. So I'm gonna take this opportunity and selfishly acknowledge you and say thank you, Yvonne, for all that you have brought. And I also wanna acknowledge your team. So everybody just stop and let's take a second. Whatever you guys think it is, it's a whole lot that happens in the background. I wanna acknowledge the entire team that has been pulling this off and our amazing moderator and panelists. I want to also just call out real quick, Tanya French-Turner, your partner on the Community Core for the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, and Ken Cabine, who's also been bringing his leadership forward, and all of our great institutional partners. We're trying to figure out if this is something that people want, if they want us to continue it. We're all trying to figure out judiciously how to spend our time. We need your feedback. We've created a very brief one minute survey. I took it myself and I heard Isaiah with all of his kids in the background. We all doing the best we can in this season. Please do not close your browser. When you end the webinar, just click leave the meeting. You're gonna get a pop-up or a brief one minute survey. We need to know if this is valuable, if it's working and if you want us to continue it. If you do log out, you will get an email within an hour. We are doing our very best to make sure that we minimize our communications to you, but make sure that people are informed. And I have shamelessly not shown my face, but I'm wearing my bedrock hoodie because I do want to encourage us all to continue to support local businesses. And I think bedrock is a great example, the rock, the hard stone, as is Flint, to make sure that not only do we come through COVID strong, but that we actually do something that's gonna transform the current state of affairs for underserved and marginalized populations. That's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. And again, I, I express my appreciation to everyone. This could not been, have been done without a great team, nor could it have been done without you who have participated in the webinar and now our live stream. As we close this webinar today, we wanna to encourage you, stay home, stay safe. If you have to go out, be safe. Provide protection for yourself, your family, and your community. And to all, from all of us, we say, God bless you.